Friends, will you pray with me? Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, move among us that we may hear God's word. And hearing it, we might respond with boldness today and every day. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Today, we are continuing our sermon series, Say What? We are tackling some of the difficult passages of Scripture, just like Peter said to the children, and I drew the short straw. (laughs) We are wondering, we are reading the words, and we're wondering what the Scripture means. It is our hope, no matter how difficult these passages may be, that we are all led to a deeper meaning and a deeper appreciation for God's Word to us, even today, even when it's difficult. The sermon lesson this morning comes from 1 Timothy, chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. The books of 1 and 2 Timothy and the book of Titus are known collectively as the pastoral letters. Scholars have debated back and forth for more than 200 years about whether or not the Apostle Paul is the author of these particular books, or someone else using his name. You can find a good number of people on either side of the argument, all learned, all devout, but differing in their understanding and their opinion. They show these books, these letters, are they show regardless, they show how Christianity and Christian theology face the challenges that they were up against in the second generation. My purpose this morning is not to make a case one way or the other, but I will say that my own studies over the years have led me to lean more in Paul's direction here than otherwise. So that is, that is the vantage point from which I am approaching this morning's message. These are considered pastoral letters because they provide instructions for the community. They help to establish the pattern of ministry and church structure. So as you read these these books, these letters, you will see language about bishops. You will see language about presbyters, about deacons. These are trustworthy documents, no matter the author. They help the church then establish itself in its infancy and to endure through the generations. So listen now that by faith you may receive God's word for you this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2 beginning at verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I didn't feel too many daggers coming at me from the front. Maybe a few from the back. You know, at the nine o'clock service, it's our custom to read the scripture from the screen as the congregation is reading. And I told them that I was, as I was, as I was looking at the screen and reading the scripture, I was also envisioning my mother, my grandmothers, my teachers from days gone by, sitting out in the congregation throwing spitwads at me as I read that passage. So I'm going to start off today by simply saying this, ooh. I do give thanks to God for the word, but sometimes the word is yucky. Sometimes it's difficult. I told someone last week that this passage of of scripture 
is assaulting to our modern North American cultural sensitivities, perhaps more than many passages. The portrayal of women as effectively gagged in church, forbidden to exercise authority over men, and restricted to the role of childbearers, modest dressers, and doers of good deeds is about as remote from most 21st century evaluations of women's roles in Western society as one can imagine. Okay, so I got that. You know where I stand and where we're going. And you can breathe and we'll keep going. So, but what do we do with this scripture in the year 2022? It is in our holy text. So what do we do with it? I've had the good fortune throughout my life to be surrounded by strong women. Today, in my own home, I enjoy life with a strong woman. The strong women of my past did not shy away from leading and taking charge in the church and beyond. My mother was a business owner and led several chambers of commerce over her career in Houston. My paternal grandmother was one of the first female personnel business owners in the state of Texas. In the 1950s, my great-grandmother, Nana, uh, my great-grandfather died in his sleep and left my Nana with his business. So in 1954, my Nana took over his office supply business in Houston. Each of these women was a leader in the church as well. In fact, my Nana was a charter member of the Second Baptist Church of Houston. Mom was on the vestry at Christ Church Cathedral and led evening prayer services. Each of them poured into me, nurturing my faith, helping me to understand who God is and was, how much God loves me, and what God expects of me. Thankfully, none of them kept silent in church. Women here and elsewhere, in this pulpit, and as deacons at the session table, caring and loving and providing leadership, have allowed Preston Hollow Presbyterian Church to be an expression, a fuller representation of the body of Christ with women's voices and leadership across its history. In our denomination, the PCUSA, the Reverend Margaret Towner was ordained as the first minister of word and sacrament on October 24th, 1956. Yay, Presbyterians. The first female ruling elder in the denomination was ordained in the 1920s. Yay, Presbyterians. I was reminded this morning that the mother of Sarah Mosley and Rebecca Gafford, two of our faithful church members, was the moderator of the PCUS, a precursor to the Presbyterian USA. She was the moderator of the entire denomination in 1978. And once the Northern Church and the Southern Church united in 1983, Ms. Mosley was the moderator of the Joint Council, the first Joint Council of the Reunited Church in 1984. This community of faith has wonderful connections, wonderful roots to the importance of leadership of women in the church. Another example, I was hearing this just this last week, Shannon Guzzi, our director of youth and college ministry, told me about her grandmother on her father's side, Joanne Yancey. She is the mother of six boys. She was uh, in her Presbyterian church back in the 1980s. The church voted and made a decision, openly made a decision, that women would not be permitted to usher. Come on, y'all. We'll take you ushering, please. (laughs) Please. But back in those old days in the 1980s, the vote was taken and women were not permitted to usher in that church. The next Sunday, Shannon tells me that her grandmother showed up with a blue blazer and picked up a stack of bulletins and stood right by the door in the back of the sanctuary 
and ushered from that Sunday forward. Yay, Shannon's grandmother. And friends, no doubt you have stories. We could spend the whole morning talking about ways that in particular women have made a difference in, the li- in our lives individually and the life of the church at large. In his book called The Religious Situation, first published way back in 1930, theologian Paul Tillich writes about the relationship between the past and the present, and he says this, The present is the past. Every present moment is a wave which has been raised by the waves of all the past. The present is what what it is only in union with all that has gone before. Friends, we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. Women and men who have paved the way for us to experience worship in this place this very day to engage in education and fellowship and service opportunities we stand on the shoulders of such people who have paved the way of the church today quite simply the church wouldn't be the church without the voices and leadership of women All of this is well and good, but we're still left with this scripture passage, these challenging verses from 1 Timothy. What do we do with the idea that women are instructed to dress a certain way, modestly, to keep silent in church, all because of the wayward path taken by Adam and Eve in the garden? And as we read that scripture and heard that message, We are reminded that the author of this letter puts the weight of blame on Eve. She's the reason Adam failed. She's the reason that he tripped up. And that, of course, we do not adhere to, but that is what is presented in this passage. The social order of the time was vastly different. The expected roles of men and women were different than today. Church and ministry was young and new and deeply influenced by how people live their lives outside of the church, in their homes. Later in this letter to 1 Timothy in chapter 3, the writer explains that he is giving these directions so that, quote, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. This highlights for us that the church The household of God mirrored the households of its people. Context is key. Context, and here is what I mean by that. In the Greek, the two words for man and woman also can mean husband and wife. And so there was a, a focus on good functioning of what was generally recognized to be society's household unit formed around husband and wife the basic unit of city and state. The the advice in this scripture, in this letter, is part of an attempt to gain wider respect for the church by ensuring that the then conventional practice of submission of the wife to her husband is not disturbed by the greater freedoms brought by the gospel. So people would go to church and they would hear the messages and they would learn that Jesus Christ sets us free and that there are no longer divisions such as between men and women. But that put the church at odds with the culture that it was surrounded by. For a church concerned to be seen as supportive of what was good for society, the only solution was to conform church in, order to, in the order to that of the well-ordered household and to forbid wives to teach or to have authority over their husbands. But why exactly? The first churches all met in private homes. So they found themselves in the very setting that was different from what the gospel was saying about humanity. So there was uncertainty as to whether the norms of behavior of those of the household or those of the church should take precedence. 
Most likely in the early days of Christianity, there were wives who exercised prophetic or other gifts that had been seen, and they had been seen to be teaching or exhorting their husbands because they had an understanding that they were free because of the gospel. They were free because of Christ and that the Spirit had given them these gifts. But to challenge the social order of the time would have been tantamount to calling marriage itself and, and question and into question and would have been regarded as undermining the very foundation of society and state. For Paul, the subordination of women to men was part of the old order of creation, not the new. And so in his letters, those letters that are undisputed written by him, like Romans and Corinthians, The undisputed letters of Paul present a more radical and diverse message affirming the equality in the church of all, regardless of race, of class, of sex, of gender. In Galatians, we read, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, submission of wives is under the rubric that all are to be subject to one another in Christ, including husbands who are to imitate Christ's self-sacrificing love toward their wives. So the author of the pastoral letters contradicts Paul and other early Christian understandings. Some scholars, and I would put me in this group, wonder whether this portion of the letter to Timothy was written by someone other than Paul under Paul's name and then inserted because it's a bit different than the rest of the of the uh, letter. This passage has been used in churches through the centuries to forbid women's religious leadership and to insist that they that the only permissible role for women is that of wife and mother. Yet the New Testament shows a wide variety of lifestyles for women and to their prominent leadership positions in the churches. And we know, we are aware that there are churches today that continue to limit the role and the voice and the presence of of women in front of the church. Freedoms for unmarried women or widows, so not wives, but unmarried women or widows in business and in church would hardly have been limitless at that time, but would certainly be greater than envisioned here. And here are just a couple of examples. In Acts, we read about Priscilla and Aquila who taught the way of God to Apollos. So Apollos, a man, was speaking about God and not being altogether uh, clear or accurate. And these two women openly taught this man the way of God. In Romans, we read about Phoebe as she is described as a deacon. And in Colossians, we read about the woman Nympha, who hosted church in her own home. Well, what can we learn for our living today? There seems to be, we've established that there is a disconnection between this text and what it says and the ways that we live life today that are accepted and that are even championed. So what is it that we can learn for our living today? What I want to drive home is simply this. Look how far we've come. Look how far we've come. Human roles are different today. Households are different today. Churches and ministry are different today. But what is the same? God is the same. God continues to call people, women and men, to serve and to lead. The Spirit is speaking and has spoken to an ever-wide range of people to lead the church, to teach, to preach, to govern, to care. And we are better for it. We are stronger for it. And as one of your pastors, I am deeply grateful for the presence of women in this church now and in the past and certainly in the future who make this church a stronger, more vibrant more accurate representation of the body of Christ. 
you might find it interesting to know that in our denomination of the Presbyterian Church USA, we are close to a 50 to 50 spread, men and women below the age of 50 years old who are uh, pastors in our church. Now that's an important qualifier, below the age of 50 years old. There, the, the mixture is 50-50. When you go above 50 years old, we are nowhere near that. There's still far more men than women, but it is, it is closer than it used to be, and it will continue uh, to, to gain as, as time passes. As a denomination, we take note now of non-binary individuals who are pursuing a call to ministry and they are included in the data as of last year. Our denomination is a part of the reformed tradition and one of the key insights, one of the key principles of that tradition is that we claim to be reformed and always reforming. We allow the spirit to move in and through the likes of humanity, women and men alike to know what it is that God is doing in the life of the corporate church, the whole body, as well as in our individual lives. I want to end with a short quote from the book of order of our church. Now I know it's not riveting reading overall. However, this paragraph amplifies the good that our church upholds when it comes to the role of women. The church's ministry is a gift from Jesus Christ to the whole church. Christ alone rules, calls, teaches, and uses the church as he wills, exercising his authority by the ministry of women and men for the establishment and extension of God's new creation. Christ's ministry is the foundation and standard for all ministry, the pattern of the one who came not to be served, but to serve. Now granted, we still have a long way to go. So may God guide our steps individually and collectively that the path we take be faithful and true to our calling by the grace and mercy of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. All thanks be to God. Amen.